Okay, welcome everybody to tonight's free webinar. This is our Zoom meeting and we are going to be talking about microbe management. So it says number seven, microbe management, because that this is the seventh class of management that I teach when I teach my boot camps and other educational things. So microbe management, we have to manage the microbes. Microbes are everything. If you don't have microbes, you are stuck in a system that fails to make money. It fails to be profitable. That is not completely true, but in the long run, people who are able to use ecology are far advanced above people who are using all of the man-made inputs. There are many farms out there nowadays that are being, um, you know, they're they're totally dependent on all of the man-made inputs. So we are talking about microbe management tonight. So that's what we're going to get into. Before we get into this slide, I just want to make it clear to everybody who sees this, that there are six things that I am doing to help you in your journey of producing food. The goal here is to produce as much food as you want. If you want to be a food producer for your own family, from your own garden, or if you are producing food for hundreds or even thousands of people, the principles of food production are the same. And these are the six ways in which I am supporting you. I have my free YouTube channel with new content every week. I have my free Zoom meeting, which is what we're doing right now, every Thursday night, except for Thanksgiving and maybe a couple of other nights during the year. But basically, it's every Thursday night of the year. I have a Patreon page, which is a subscription you can get on, and that gives you access to all of my videos that I have made about how to produce food. And then I have my 17-week farmer career training course. You come here, you live on site in Clover Valley, Nevada for 17-week growing season. I teach you everything I know on how to grow food so that you can go home understanding ecology, understanding how to reverse desertification, understanding how to produce food. This is a production class. This is not a business class. This is a production class. We do talk about some business, but this is about food production. And the next one is, <laughs> excuse me, is a laboratory. I am a soil lab. I can do soil samples for your soils so that we can see where your microbes are and understand what your soil is doing, if it is ecologically active or not. And the last one is I am available for consulting. If you need consulting to grow food, I am here for you. So let's get into tonight's class on microbe management. We've got to remember, first of all, microbes are the most important livestock. We all know that we have to have a lot of diversity. And if we don't know that, then you do now. So we all know that we have to have lots of diversity in our ecology to have the best food. We need a massive amount of diversity of plants, animals, insects, and all of the other things that are alive. We need lots and lots of diversity. The more life we have, the better off we're gonna be. So in recent years, in the last 100 years, there's been this mindset that we need to kill things on our farm. We need to kill bad bugs. We need to kill disease. We need to kill anything that does not serve us. And this is not a good mindset because what we have learned is that the more we kill stuff, the harder it is to grow the things we want to grow. And this goes against the nature of the way that many of us were raised in agriculture. So we have to have a different, we, we need to change our paradigms. We have to have a mental shift to think about this. So when we're thinking of livestock, remember microbes are our most important livestock. Why is that true? And it's because microbes release the plant nutrients from the sands, the silts, the clay particles, so that the plants grow with no fertilizer. If we are adding fertilizers to our soils, it's because our soils do not function. Once we create a functioning soil, we don't need to purchase any of the expensive um, fertilizers that are out there. 
And then that leads to not needing any uh, pest, pesticides or herbicides, any of that stuff. We simply don't need it anymore because when the soil functions properly, the plants are so healthy that they become resilient and they withstand bad environmental problems. So you may have a very wonderful house for your microbes to live in, but if the microbes aren't there living in the house, then you are lonely. You don't have good neighbors. So what the heck does that mean? Here's what it means. Once you have created a functioning soil, a really nice, great soil, then we need to focus on the fact that we get the microbes there. Let me give you a quick analogy. You could say, I'm going to be a cattle farmer. And so you put a, get a thousand acres, you put up a really nice fence, you have a nice barn, you have a machine shed, you have a ranch house, and you put hay and salt licks and everything the cattle need out there. You have a nice watering trough, and there's beautiful grass growing. And you go out six months later to round up the cows and there's no cows there because you never put cows there in the first place. Okay, so this is a dumb analogy, but just remember that that's how a lot of times people start doing this regenerative agriculture thing and they say, well, well, the microbes, it, this, it doesn't work because my microbes aren't working. Well, the question is, do you even have microbes there? Are the microbes actually there? Because if you don't put them there, it's just like the cattle analogy. If you don't buy a herd of cattle and put them on the ranch or the farm or out there in the pasture, then you never started actually growing cattle. You had everything else. So we th may think that we're doing it a natural, beautiful way, but we need to get the microbes there. So when we're thinking about micromanagement, the first thing we do is have to get microbes. And the best way to get them is to collect them in your own environment. And the best way to do that is to start a compost pile. You've got to start a compost pile and you need to do it the right way. You need to do like the Johnson Sioux um, bioreactor or you need to do the Dr. Elaine Ingham's method. Do a, do a good method of compost. Don't just pile up a bunch of biomass and get it wet and then start turning it once in a while with a machine thinking you're making compost. You're most likely not making compost. Um, I feel like you're, you're just making um, putrefying trash. So you need to know how to do it. So how are you going to learn compost? Well, I can teach you how to make compost. If you're a Patreon member, I have many, many videos about compost. Uh, we've done composts on this free class on Thursday nights. So those recordings are on YouTube. Start researching everything that I've taught to learn compost. And of course, you, we have the free Q&As. You can ask questions later tonight if you need to know how to make compost. So what do we do with the compost to get the microbes out there? We simply spread the compost on the garden or if we have a large area, like if we have multiple greenhouses, or if we have acres that we're dealing with, even thousands of acres, then we would create a compost extract, which stretches the, the uh, microbes further so that we can get the land inoculated with the good microbes on a larger scale, okay? Um, another principle is don't till the soil. If you're tilling the soil, you're killing the fungus. And fungus is one of the most important microbes in the soil, and it's one of the easiest ones to kill and one of the hardest ones to establish in your soils. And killing, uh, I mean, tilling the soil kills the fungus really easy. So avoid tillage. Now, there may be some appropriate times for tillage, but we absolutely till way too much with modern machines. It has made agriculture so easy that we are tempted to till way more than we should. Uh, the other thing to manage our microbes and keep them healthy, keep the soil protected from sunlight with a mulch, with a compost, with a cover crop. With, I don't care how you cover the soil, but keep it covered. You should never see bare soil. I have an analogy. It's a, it's a bad analogy, um, but just think about it. If you took a razor blade and you took your arm and you cut a big section out of your arm, 
and you just peeled the skin off and threw it away. And so half your arm is missing skin. And then you just go to work. You go about life like nothing happened to your arm. That is about as good as the soil functions when it's not covered. Bare soil is like a person with no skin. We would struggle to function very well. We would have issues with proper functioning. So always keep the soil covered with, with mulch, with uh, living plants, with compost, with a rolled down cover crop, with living cover, cover crops, living plants. Whatever you can cover the soil with, keep it covered. The next thing to manage your microbes is have a living root in the soil all the time to feed the microbes. You always are growing plants. And this is a problem in modern agriculture. So many times we have gone to uh, the place of just growing a monocrop and we're growing it for four months of the year. We grow it, we harvest it. And then the rest of the year, the ground is bare. It is a very bad thing. We need to keep the ground covered and we need to have a living root in the soil. So if we're going to have a period of months without a living crop, plant a cover crop after your cash crop. And that keeps that living root in the soil. Why do we do that? To continually feed the microbes because the root exudates, which is sugars, carbohydrates, proteins that come out of the roots. They feed the microbes in the soil, which will keep your soil functioning. Now, you need to grow diversity, many different kinds of plants in the same place at the same time. So instead of having one big bed of carrots, you need to have four plant families growing together. So you're going to mix up um, carrots, tomatoes, broccoli, onions, um, let a few weeds grow. Uh, so there are options for this. Why do we do that? Because it makes more microbes grow than if we have a monocrop. And your soil will function better. Your crops will do better. That's why. Um, always use cattle manure in your compost. If you can graze cattle in your food producing land at a certain time of year, do it. The animal impact of cattle is fantastic. Um, the cattle is the one animal that can eat one acre of grass. And then she fertilizes two acres. Most animals can't do that, but the bovine can. Okay, my next slide here. Uh, so I've got a picture here of a couple of different plants. I've got fibrous root plants here. I have a legume here, and I have a tap root. So on the far right side, we have the the grass. That's actual actually a cereal rye, and that's a fibrous root plant. The roots on this rye plant can get 380 miles long. And I've read some recent articles that say they're even longer than that. But a publication a few years ago, um, they documented 380 miles. There's been re researchers since that show more than that. So that's a massive amount of uh, the, the rhizosphere inside of the soil that's feeding the microbes. It feeds the microbes nutrients while the plant is alive. When the plant dies, it becomes part of the detritus sphere that's down in the soil. And as the, the big roots, like that daikon radish in the middle, when it decomposes, it contributes that organic matter to, the, to feed the microbes. And it also becomes part of the drillosphere because it has a big shaft, a big hollow space in the ground where water, oxygen, um, microbes and macros can get down in there too. A lot of bugs can get down in there, which is pretty great. And of course we have the hairy vetch and I put it on a white piece of paper here so you can see that white uh, contrast on the roots. And you can see that those roots are covered with a beautiful rhizo sheath. That dirt that's right around the each of those roots, it's beautifully covered. The glomulin from the microbes is gluing all of those particles to those pieces of roots. And it's a fantastic, beautiful, wonderful thing um, to have that. So that is what a healthy root looks like. When you dig up a plant, look at the roots before the dirt all falls off. And if, if you cannot see white roots because they look like that hairy vetch that's on the white paper, that is exactly what you're looking for. You have arrived at a stage of soil health. Now, your soil may not be functioning all the way, but you certainly are on your way to doing something right because the only thing that's going to make the dirt particles stick to the roots like that 
is the glomulin from the the microbes that are the glomulin is the glue but it's it's hooking those particles to the to the plant roots so that is what healthy roots look like when you're pulling up plants and they're just these white pure white looking roots um, you have a lot of work to do so when we are managing for these microbes we want to, there's the three main things you need to do and i reiterated those here on this slide number one You've got to inoculate the soil with the microbes. Inoculate is a fancy word that means introduce. So if it's in the world of human disease, it would be to vaccinate. We are introducing something to a new environment. So we are inoculating the soil with the beneficial microbes. Where do we get the beneficial microbes? From the compost that we make. And I've had other classes on that. I'm not really going to go into that tonight. So we make the compost that collects the beneficial microbes in your own area. If you purchase microbes from another area, that's that's not a good idea because the microbes that are going to live in your climate could be different than where you purchased from. So you need to make compost in your own location. That's an important thing. Um, so you inoculate your soils with a compost extract. And then you maintain your detritosphere. I'll remind you that detritosphere is the trash that's on top. That would be leaves that fall from trees. It's the dead plant matter that, that falls on the ground. If you mow a crop, it's what falls on the ground and stays there. All of the things that um, naturally die and go flat on the ground are your detritosphere. The purpose of the detritosphere is it feeds microbes. Your decomposing microbes will eat the detritus. Okay, so number one, we inoculate. by So you put your herd of cattle out there. Number two, you give the microbes a detritus sphere. That's like feeding the cattle grass or hay. Number three, you maintain a living root in the soil all year. So instead of having a crop that you grow, and you say, okay, I have a, I, I have a wheat crop. And then I'm going to plant it in September and harvest it in July. Well, what are you doing um, July, August, September? And a lot of those fields are bare. They shouldn't be. They should be planted to something else. We, and if it's a corn crop and you plant in May and then you harvest in October, what are you doing from October all winter to May? Well, don't leave those soils bare. They need to have a detritus sphere on top of them and they need to have a living root growing in the soil. So this is this. There's a lot of complicated things about this. But what I have done is we've taken this information from the very complex. We've jumped over complex to simplicity. So if you want a functioning soil, you need to manage your microbes. All right. You've got to manage your microbes. So you have to create your microbes by making a local compost pile. That compost pile will collect the microbes that live in your area. They blow in on the wind, so you don't have to do too much, okay? So they blow in on the wind. And then the next thing, you inoculate that soil with the microbes, and then you maintain the detritosphere which is the dead organic matter on top. So you want to manage that so that the microbes have food. And then you maintain a living root in the soil. And the reason you're maintaining the living root in a soil is to feed microbes. Okay? So let me reiterate this in a different way. The two food sources for microbes are the living roots and the detritosphere. And that's what they eat. Now, remember, they're not eating the root. They are eating what the plant chooses to give them. So some people say, oh, I don't want a microbe eating my roots. That's bad. Well, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what the plant chooses to feed them in the form of exudates. So they're not actually chomping the roots. All right. So that is, that is the end of that. I'm going to go back to my previous slide. That is not the previous slide. That is the previous slide. So there's my 
Oh, sorry. Let me do that again. Okay, I'll leave it there. Okay, so so micromanagement. It's very, very simple, and we have covered it in other classes, but if we don't think of this um, in a really clear way of managing microbes, like if we just left managing microbes out and we just talk about irrigation management and pest and disease management and greenhouse management and all these other things that we deal with, if we leave micromanagement out, we are leaving out the most important thing, okay? So this was quick, this was short, and this was basically, this is basically it. I'm, I'm going to open this up for questions now. If you have any questions, we have options. You can type into the chat, and I will read those, or you can unmute yourself, and you can ask me a question. So if you have any questions about anything to do with your farms, your gardens, your soils, um, your soil management, um, building greenhouses, anything to do with food production, I will try to answer that. So go ahead and ask me your questions. So if you don't have uh, cattle manure, uh, you know, some of these uh, bags uh, call, uh, uh, you know, our, our packaged manure. What do you think of those? Would that uh, okay. be a good substitute? That is a good, I'm glad you asked that, John. That is good. So if you go to a place like a Home Depot or a Lowe's or any garden center that's selling bagged up stuff, and they call it, normally they call it steer manure. I would not purchase that. I don't like it. It usually has a high salt content in it because they're usually gathering it out of feedlots and feedlots feed their cattle a high um, ration of salt, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing for the health of the cattle, but it's not good for your uh, microbes in your soils. It's not good for your plants. So I would not purchase, um, I would not purchase a uh, like a commercial bagged product that is any kind of bovine manure, like steer manure or cattle manure. When I say cattle manure, I'm talking about your cow that you're saving your own manure from, or your neighbor, uh, because um, the the manures that have been in a pile for a long time generally have gone anaerobic they're growing um, disease type of you know creatures in them the, the bad microbes uh, a lot of times when you open those bags it's very black which shows that it has been at a hot temperature and it has gone anaerobic and when we pull soil samples from those type of products when we look at them under the micro microscope let me be clear when we pull a soil sample from the black products, whether it's a compost or cattle manure or whatever, if they are black in color, we almost always find disease causing organisms in those, uh, which is not necessarily a good thing. So it's, it's, uh, I mean, you know, I feel bad for a lot of people because they don't necessarily have access to a lot of these good products, which is too bad. Uh, but we just we simply need more farmers. We need more agriculture. We need access to more of the good things. I mean, there's nothing better than a good cow manure, you know. We'll pick up two or three hundred cow pies out of a field, and you can work with that. But when it's been managed in a corporate way and turned anaerobic, it's a completely different product. But there's been a lot of bad talk about cattle and their manure and methane and all of these things creating problems in the atmosphere. And there's a lot of truth to that when it comes to the corporate world. Um, the animal itself, there's nothing that sequesters more carbon than the bovine because of the what they will do to make the grass grow. And the grasses will grow extremely deep roots. You know, We're talking 12, 15, 18 feet deep. Some of those roots are extremely deep. They're so deep we can't hardly see how far they actually go with those micro roots. And they're sequestering amazing amounts of carbon, way more then get sequestered if you don't have get cattle grazing that land. So it's this beautiful symbiotic relationship. 
And we can see that. You can come out to the ranches and we can take a backhoe out and we can actually look at that. We can dig down and see what's happening on fields, side-by-side -side tests of where cattle are grazing properly, where cattle are overgrazing, and where there are no cattle. And interestingly enough, where there are no cattle, like most of the national parks in the United States, they've removed livestock decades ago, and those places are desertifying faster than anywhere else, faster than places that are being overgrazed, which is, which you know, it's almost heresy for me to say such a thing, but I'm just telling you the observations of science. That this is what we're actually seeing. So we need to turn some of these things around. And we need a lot more researchers. We need thousands more masters and doctoral researchers out there figuring out exactly what's happening with the nematode and all the different microarthropods because the when we understand the interactions then we better know how to manage to make the world a greener more beautiful place and to green the sahara okay that was a very long answer and i don't even know if i answered it john but yeah you did and uh, and so the uh, the cow crops the uh, or cuts the crops the uh, grass and that makes it uh, grow deeper is that what you're saying or yes it does yeah, the, the, the bovine does an amazing amount of things. Number one, it eats the grass, and when it cuts it with its teeth, it wraps its tongue around a bunch of grass. I'll be a cow for a minute. Ah, it wraps its tongue around, and then it cuts it with its bottom teeth because a bovine does not have top teeth. Horses do, but cattle don't, and it cuts it with the bottom teeth. Microbes in the mouth of that cow, if you've ever been around cattle, you will see that they're very slobbery. And the, the, uh, the slobber gets on that grass. There are microbes in there that stimulate that to grow. And of course, they urinate, and that's almost pure nitrogen. There's some other things in urine, but it's mostly nitrogen, which is a great stimulant for that grass to grow back. And then they defecate, which is where they poop out gallons and gallons a day. It's amazing how much a cow can poop. But they, they make all these cow pies all day long. And that becomes the detritus sphere on that grass, which feeds the microbes. And then there's a whole symbiotic relationship with, with beetles. There's a thing called a dung beetle. And there's many different species of <laughs> dung beetles. And they will, uh, they will get inside that cow pie the day that it it's lands on the ground. And they will drill holes underneath it deep into the ground. Now, I don't know how deep, but inches deep. Some of them go maybe an inch or two deep, and other species will probably go five or six inches deep. I'm not an expert on these dung beetles, but I do know that they will take the manure down in there in the ground, and when they get it down in there, what does it do? It decomposes. It turns into the most wonderful compost down there in the ground, and that feeds that grass so that it can grow. But there's another thing. So that's four things that they're doing. Let's just review them. The saliva, the urine, and the um and the poop okay and then the fourth thing they do is the hoof action as their hooves tromp the ground it breaks up all the different types of grass that grow in a bunch it breaks up the crown of that um of that uh bunch grass and there's many species that are a bunch grass and when they break that up it stimulates new growth to come out now you can stimulate the same growth with a fire uh, you can stimulate that kind of growth by driving a car or a truck on it. Uh, but if you have a cow do it, it has all these other benefits. And then in the old days, um, like, you know, let's say prehistoric times, predators would move that herd on. So they would eat for one day where the grass was. They'd eat all the grass and then they'd move on. And then it was maybe a year or a, and a half or something before the before the, uh, the the herds would come back. We're talking about elk, bison, um, deer, antelope in the, I mean, think of all the diverse species there are in Africa, you know, on the Serengeti and other places. There's all kinds of herding animals and the predators keep them moving. So it's pretty incredible to see uh, to see this happen in the ecology. So absolutely, the cattle um, being managed like that sequesters so much carbon. It is so amazing. And so all this talk from the science, you know, there's a lot of political talk about it. And that drives me nuts because they don't have good answers. 
they need some good ecologists to give them the answers. And I just don't see that happening in the political, uh, the talks that are happening. And that's frustrating to me. But anyway, if we really want to sequester carbon, we need 10 times more cattle with people who have proper management skills. We don't want more cattle if they're going to be in feedlots. We don't want more cattle if they're going to overgraze the land. But if we had 10 times more cattle than we have today, being managed properly, growing more grass, we could green the Sahara Desert and it would stop any kind of a global warming or any kind of, you know, climate change problem that political people are talking about all the time. It would simply solve it. It would have to. The, you do the math and that solves the problems. So uh, my dad used to go uh, into the uh, bucket out the sep septic tank, empty the septic tank onto the field. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> Is that... So septic... <laughs> so so like if he did that every day, it probably would be, you know, that's that's a thought. But I'm assuming he would do it once a year, once every five years. I don't know. Uh, yeah. So it would be very anaerobic. Um, septic tanks have no oxygen mm -hmm. in them, so they decompose anaerobically. And we certainly want septic tanks to decompose because as human waste goes into the septic tanks, any type of a, a you know, a disease, a sickness, it would go in there. We want that to die. That's why we have septic tanks and sewer systems is to control human disease. So, yeah, maybe not the best idea. Okay, but what about the runoff that goes down the tile? And, uh, you know, I mean, it's uh, the uh, you can almost see the tile because the grass is greener over that than it is in other yeah but, so yeah yeah it's i mean it's certainly high in nitrogen so it's making that grass grow green so that's why it's growing green okay uh, we won't use that <laughs> it's probably not the best thing to use on a food producing system because you know i mean if somebody was sick and you got e coli in your food and then it, you're not breaking the cycle you might as well just be using the bathroom on the garden <laughs> the whole purpose of, of of sewage, a sewage system and a septic tank, is to break the cycle of disease. Okay. So, um, yeah. I mean, you could certainly compost human waste, and it would be just fine. If you composted it properly, it would be okay. And how do you know if you compost it properly? Well, after a week or so of the composting process, and it's completely oxygenated, it would have no smell anymore. As soon as the smells go away, the, the offensive odors, then your your bad microbes are dying and they're gone. So that would be one way to tell. Well, then I, it would be all right, if, you know, all right if I took the pot from under my bed and just threw it out on oh, the garden. Oh, John. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You must be from the old no. days. <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay, what other questions do we have tonight? How can uh, I help you grow food? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, you can hear me because you could hear John. Um, I am finding as I'm um, planting things along the sides of our house where we had to use wood chips, but they're died. I'm finding the wood chips are turning white. Um, it looks like there's some things growing on them, I guess. Is that um, the good microbes beginning to grow right on the wood chips? Yes, that's good. It's just the and, microbes that are breaking it down. So that's good. Awesome. That's what you want. Okay. And so when I'm kind of clearing them away to get down to the actual dirt, which is orchard stuff, um, to plant a plant, um, do I want to put some of that back into the hole, the little hole no. that I'm in? No, don't put it back in? No, don't put it in it back in the hole. Just dig your hole, put your plant in, and okay. then just cover around the surface. Right. I mean, the, you know, if you got a little bit in the hole, it's not going to hurt anything, but it certainly uh -huh. is not going to help you. Oh, okay. You got to remember, we're mimicking na natural systems, and the very few places in nature yeah, do do we find the wood chips, the detritus in a forest down deep in the earth. Okay. And so the microbes that are decomposing on the surface, they know how to go down in the soil and do their thing that helps the plants grow. 
but there's not many microbes down in there that know quite what to do with it. So it's oh. not really going to help you to put them down in there. We find that when we do till wood chips in, that's when we start to have nitrogen deficiencies because the wood chips tie up nitrogen. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of that before, but that's a thing that happens, meaning that the plants don't get nitrogen, so your plants are suffering from nitrogen. That happens when we till those wood chips in underneath the ground. Um, so what you want to do is focus on just keeping it on that soil surface. Okay. Don't don't mix it in. Great. So just kind of put it back. Yeah. All right. You probably explained why you want to keep the soil from uh, sunlight. Uh, sunlight heats up the soil surface. On a large area, it will um, evaporate, not evaporate, but that hot air will rise into the air. If a cloud comes along, it creates a high pressure and it moves those clouds further on. And so it stops rainfall on your area. So if you have, so that's one reason. The other reason is the superheated ground will kill microbes. Your most beneficial microbes want to be at the same temperature range as humans. They want to be around 70 degrees. When it gets above 90, they start shutting down their, uh, their functionality. Over 100, a lot of them die. Wow. And we can, we've done a lot of side-by-side -side soil tests in the middle of the day with a thermometer. And one soil surface that's bare can be 30 degrees hotter than a soil two feet away that is covered with some type of mulch or detritus. Yeah. And so the way that the soil functions, those, those microbes functioning, stops if the sunlight's hitting them. So mainly it, it's uh, the idea of keeping the, the soil cool. The other reason it will um, evaporate a lot of moisture out of the ground um, if the sunlight's hitting the soil, but if the sunlight is hitting mulch, it does not evaporate the, so the soil moisture. That's good to know. I mean, I guess we need to do that on our garden. Yeah, yeah no, no bare soil, never have bare soil. If you have bare soil, it is just like having bare skin. You would never skin the skin off of your arm and then go to work uh, pretending nothing happened to you. What, what do your plants begin to look like when that is occurring? What kind of, yeah, what kind of uh, conditions do we see in our they plants? They lose turgor. They, instead of being up here like this and they're happy, they go like this and they slump down. They okay. look wilty. What does the stem begin to look like? Uh, it doesn't change too much. Okay. It's usually I'm the wondering. leaves. I'm wondering what got to our um, 1827. Um, you, well, you know, in a severe case, it could, I mean, you you certainly could burn stems if it got real hot. If it gets over 110, stuff's going to start burning. Okay. We have herbs in that square foot garden that are doing great, but the two or three tomatoes that we had that I wanted to grow are, are not really growing that well. Uh -huh. So I just wondering what it looked like because we did not cover it with, we didn't cover it with bark or anything, did we? No. Nope. Okay. All right. And um, I have a question about the Johnson Sioux or Dr. Ings methods for composting. Have you covered that? Those particular methods before? Um, we have mentioned them in several other classes. The Johnson Sioux one is the one where you you make a static pile, but it is it's in a round circular um, tray. I, I let me let me stop screen share here and see if I can go find it. Let me. Okay. See. I don't know. Let me see. I won't stop sharing screen, but let me see if I can find a picture of a Johnson Sioux. Okay, and then maybe you can show us the other one too. So, okay, here's the picture of the Elaine Ingham one. Can you see this picture? It's pretty shaded. Let me let me turn it on like this. There, is that better? Yeah. yeah. So oh, see, yeah. This, see this round wire cage? Oh, sure, this yeah. This is the Elaine Ingham way. And so if you go to the Patreon videos, you will see me doing this. So I have a whole series of like 30 days. Every day I made a video of what's happening today, where we the first day we gathered materials, we put this whole thing together. And then we every time it was 
we turned it. It's all on videos day after day. This is the Elaine Ingham way. Okay. And so this is that. Let me let me go back and try to find a picture of the Johnson Sioux now. I'm not sure. I'm not sure which presentation it's in. It's right here. Isn't that nice to be prepared? So this is a picture of Johnson Sioux. These are his pictures off the internet, not mine. So these are his actual ones. No, he's the doctor from uh I think it's he works with Chico, California, and also with the uh, Northern New Mexico. I forget the name of that university, but he's worked with both of them. Uh, but they, these ones are actually in New Mexico. But this is a static pile. He builds it once, and after he builds it, the day after he builds it, he pulls all of these white pipes out, these white and blue pipes. They come out after 24 hours. Because after 24 hours, the compost material in here, it won't collapse in. So mm -hmm. it leaves it like this for a year and a half. Wow. And the air shafts will stay in there. So he puts an automatic uh, waterer on there. So it gives a little bit of water every day to keep it at 70% moisture. So depending on your climate and time of year, how much water you give it is going to be different. But, he, but this is how he builds it. So after a year and a half, this is collected the maximum amount of microbes that humans know how to collect beneficial microbes okay after maybe a month um, he adds earthworms to this just little red wigglers or icenia fideta and then those earthworms are going to eat this and they will turn it into a, a fantastic inoculant to restore our soils so that they will function and he's done tests on all kinds of agricultural lands and home gardens and all kinds of crops, cotton, corn. There's There's been hundreds of farmers, almost said thousands. That's probably not true, but hundreds of farmers across the world have tried this method and it is working very well. And so people are now not using the commercial fertilizers that are so inhibitively expensive to create food because we don't have to use them. We can still farm like in the 1800s using compost, but with modern machines so that one farmer can feed a thousand people. But we don't have to do it with the toxic stuff in the in all the soils and everything. And the um, the holes there are to allow air. Yeah, the hole the shafts that go down in this compost are to allow oxygen. Look at the bottom over here. If you can see my cursor, see this yeah. pallet? So these are on pallets, so air can go up all the way through. Hmm. And that way you don't have to turn it. So you build this once, fill it up, pull mm -hmm. the shafts out the next day, keep it watered for a year and a half. In a year and a half, you harvest it. And add your earthworms after a month or so, once it starts to decompose. We had a, what was he? A biologist or... What was his profession? We had a nice old man when we lived in Missouri. He was in his 90s. He wanted us to learn his method of composting. And what he did was he built um, a, a taller, maybe four feet to five feet tall, maybe it's five feet tall, um, four by fours. Of course, they weren't really four by fours, untreated, but you left a hole between each four by four. It was lined with a, um, like what he did in that, the Johnson Sioux method, lined with that fabric, I guess. Um, and then you layered it. You did one layer of compost and then the next layer of chopped up wood and then compost and chopped up wood. And just finally, after adding all of that, it wasn't completely full, but you could start to get out of the bottom of that, the decayed, compost yeah but because it had the the holes in yeah. between the three by four by fours or whatever they are uh -huh. um they're not really four by four but that's what we bought we bought four by fours and they were really expensive and then we put it near a tree big mistake because the roots of the tree started growing up into the compost and it was the happiest tree because it had all this wonderful compost right next to it but we also had the tree roots in the compost and that's well, so great. It was a mistake, one, but... one of the things that he uh, espoused was the idea of using rebar. Oh yeah, that too. On the 
uh, on the corners or whatever along the side yeah. so that uh, I guess he felt felt that the rods helped uh, in the composting process. Because when lightning came or we had a storm around it, it would energize the soil in the compost bin. And so that's what held the four by fours together in the corners. You drill a hole through them mm -hmm. and then you put the holes right down on top of the rebar. Well, we'll have to experiment further on that because our first experiment wasn't very good. No, because we put it right by a tree, but I want to do it again. He said, he. what was, do you think? Yeah. William? What is your opinion of that? Have you sounds expensive to buy all that equipment? The rebar. <laughs> yeah. The rebar and the four by fours. Well, uh, I he could be also, the editor of the Cheapskate Gazette, so I wouldn't do that. After the fact, cheaper. yeah, after the fact, he said, oh, you didn't need four by fours. They're not really four by fours, whatever they are, but they had to be untreated. Yeah. yeah so you frankly. can just get some old pallets for free. Uh-huh. Okay. Just get some nasty old pallets for free, and it's easier. Yeah. 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 And of course, so how do you know, again, you told us a long time ago, how do you know a pellet is untreated? It it's, has a number on it or white. something? It's white. Nobody uses treated lumber to make a pallet. They're, they're, okay. too, they're too disposable. All right. But that has air circulation through it. That yeah. would have air circulation. Yeah. We just need to find some tree person that has to get rid of their wood. You know, they have to dispose of it somewhere. They're chopped up wood and get a whole yeah, pile of that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, Ephraim, do you have any questions tonight? Not right now. Okay. Um, okay, sounds good. All right. Well, maybe we'll end. Is that okay? Yeah. I think so. I All right. the questions. Okay. Good luck with your gardens. I'll be back next Thursday. Okay. We have a bunch of fun Patreon videos coming out. Show those with your friends if they care. And that will be great. Um, um, I do have ready? another question. Is it too late to plant right now where we live? I know it is probably for you. So you're in northern you Utah. What do you want northern. to plant? What are your what are you thinking? Um, well, something short, um, spinach, carrots in the ground would be fine, wouldn't they? You need, you right now where it's already the 1st of September, you need to be looking at varieties that have the shortest maturity date. Okay. So lettuce, spinach, okay. kale, collards, kohlrabi, um, cabbage, um, cabbage, green onions. Cabbage, really? I think, Doesn't... oh yeah, if we have a late fall. <laughs> If we don't have hard frost until November, you can you could raise something like uh, like the early, what are they called? Those little pointed ones. Uh, what's the name? Like Golden Acres are early, but there's one that's a week earlier. Oh, really? I don't know. Just research your, yeah, research your varieties for very short maturity dates. Okay. Yeah, it's not too late. You could plant fava beans right now. You'll harvest those in the springtime. Okay. They'll winter over. You could plant grains right now, and then you can make bread in the winter. I mean, the next summer. What I was thinking is they'll grow through the winter, but you probably don't have two acres to grow grain. In fact, I know you don't because you've told me, but. <laughs> right. But we are going to grow grasses, like you said, as soon as that gets done. They're not coming till September 6th, so we can't even. What about, uh, what about garlic? Do you guys eat garlic? Because now is yeah. when you plant it. Right. Yeah, plant your garlic. If you don't have garlic seed, go to the grocery store and buy a few cloves, break them up and plant them like God. six inches apart. I put garlic with my roses because garlic loves roses and roses love garlic. Oh, that's good. I'm glad you taught me that. Every rose needs a garlic beside it. That's or right. Okay, we're going to call it for tonight. Thank Next you. week, we're going to awesome. be talking about another management principle. Awesome. If you have any emergencies during the week, text me and we will save your food production system. Good night and have great gardening. Great. Awesome. Love your classes. Thank you. Thank you.